I hope you are ready for uh, the last talk before our big break, where we will see each other in the in the hallway. Um, our next talk is uh, by Brandon Weaver. And uh -huh. here he is. Ta-da! <laughs> Welcome, Brendan. Great to be here. Um, well, the talk of today is interesting twofold for me. Once is pattern matching. This is also something uh, kind of new. I mean, it's 2.7, but it's still kind of new to the Ruby world uh, compared to the origins. And the other one is about poker. Uh, so... <laughs> um, Brandon here is a Ruby architect. Uh, he works at Square and um, he helps his company defining standards for uh, Ruby. And he's also an artist and there's something about limers and cartoons and programming that I have failed to grasp, but I would like to hear more about that <laughs> afterwards if you have a few minutes to uh, hang out with us. <laughs> yeah. um, welcome. Glad to be here. I guess I can leave the stage to you then. Okay. Hello, hello. Shall we get started? So glad you can make it. So take a seat, get comfy, because we're about to go on a wild ride through the depths of Ruby pattern matching and explore some novel usages and new ideas into this brand new and exciting feature that was introduced in Ruby 2.7. But to start with, who exactly am I? Simply put, my name is Brandon, I work for Square, and I like doing all manner of fun things to Ruby. Hence this talk! You can find my Twitter in the bottom left of most of the slides, which will have resources to the talk, as well as other fun information if you wish to find out more. In the meantime, though, shall we get started? Now, we're going to start with a short preview into pattern matching just to see what it looks like before we dig into this problem. So the following code may have been fairly common in older versions of Ruby, but with 2.7, we introduced a new syntax, pattern matching. So this code might look something like this. It compares every value using triple equals and can use array-like or hash-like strategies for matching. Now, we'll be looking primarily at array-like matchers this round, but what exactly is that doing? It's comparing each element of that array positionally. The first should be an integer, the second should be a two, and the third should just be there. Now, granted, this also captures nil, making it not quite 100% of match, but it does serve a point. There's also the experimental one-liner syntax, which I'll be using heavily in this talk, and it may or may not come into future versions of Ruby. Given its usefulness and some of the documented use cases of this feature, though, I believe that it probably and likely will be. And I certainly hope so, because it's all types of fun. So anyway, where were we? Ah, right, yes. So I like lemurs, and lemurs like games. In particular, They've figured out how to play poker, but are horrible at scoring games, so they've asked us to step in and help and use pattern matching to do just that. Convoluted maybe a bit, perhaps, but fun nonetheless. So, to start out with, we're going to need to set up some structure for our game, like, say, a card or maybe a hand. So, let's start out with something simple, like creating a single card. Now, we start with a new class to describe our card. And inside there, I like to start with constants because constants describe what exactly our data is, how we validate it, what it should look like, and gives us some idea about the structure of what's contained inside of it. So let's start with suits. S for spades, H for hearts, D for diamonds, and C for clubs. Now we could use Unicode symbols for this, but I believe this is much quicker for typing out. And honestly, I can never remember those codes and don't feel like going to Wikipedia to find them. So next up, we want to do something about ranks. 
Now, ranks go up from 2 all the way to ace, or ace to king, depending on your interpretation in the game. For the purpose of ranking in this particular variant, we prefer this order. Now, we also want all of them to be strings, so we don't have to coerce numbers everywhere else downstream, hence having the numbers 2 through 10 as strings. We also want to give them a numerical index we can reference to find out what that associated score is for each rank. While we could use some form of find index here, there is quicker for runtime and for later reference as a constant. Now that leaves us with a few constants to describe the data of this class. Next, we're actually going to want to make a card. And a card is a combination of a suit like spades and a rank like ace. Now given that, we want to be able to actually do something with this card, so let's take a look at creating a hand, which is a collection of many cards. So to start out with, Let's take a look at defining some constants for our hand class. To start out with, we want to know what the order of types of hands are and what their scores are. In this case, a royal flush is the highest and a high card is the lowest. We'll get into each one of these examples later as we go through this talk. Though normally I'd use multiple lines here in an editor to make this more readable, the slide doesn't quite have that much room, so you will have to forgive me for this for the moment. Now, after we have those scores, we want to have a list from backwards or reversed order to see that Royal Flush happens to have the highest score of 10 all the way down to high card which has a score of 1. Now the score map just inverts that to where 10 points is Royal Flush, 1 to high card, and this will be very useful for later. Now let's take a look at how a hand is actually constructed. Now a hand is a container of cards which means that we have many cards we initialize with. But there's something very interesting about this. You might notice one particular piece of code that's going to be very, very important for this later, which is sort. But we'll leave that alone for now. Just keep that in mind for the moment. Now, we're also going to want some niceties to make it easier to create cards and hands and view what's inside them for either presentation or debugging or both or any other purpose. So let's take a look at actually viewing a card. So going back to our card class, we might start with an array bracket method on self as an effective alias for new. And you might notice this from some classes like set or old school hash before we had 2h, in which we could pass the same arguments as new. You might also notice the dot dot dot, which is forwarding all arguments from the original call onto the new call. And the equals sign there is for a one-line method definition. Both are new in Ruby 3, and you might see them a little bit more throughout this talk. So now back to our card. We're also going to want to have a string and array representation of them. Now, nothing too terribly exciting here, except using one-liner methods for quick definitions. Parens are required if there are no arguments, hence their presence here. So if we had a card the output of those might look a little bit something like this. Now back to our card again, we have a really interesting method which is introduced to enable pattern matching called deconstruct. This is a hook for pattern matching that tells our class how to match against array-like patterns when asked. Oftentimes 2a is a good starting point, but for some classes this might be different, but that's beyond the scope of our immediate talk. Next up, we'll look at some nice methods for creating cards. So looking at our card class again, we can define a method called from string or from str to represent importing a string. Now, while I could type out the extra brackets or new, this allows us to be very succinct in how we actually create a new card and very much like what we might see if we were to enter this manually. In the case, of the first character, it's a suit, which is going to have the remaining be the rank. Now you might notice one dot dot here instead of just one. That's interesting. And why I'm doing this is because that very well could be 10. So you might have S10 instead of S9 or S Ace or S anything else. Now this is another new feature in Ruby 2.7, which is endless range, 
or you could also have beginningless range. This implies a negative one at the front, or if we put it in the opposite of dot dot one, a zero at the front. Now let's say we had an ace of spades here. This makes it much easier to instantiate that, which gives us back exactly a shiny card that we'd like. Next up, we'll want some similar methods for viewing our hands. So let's take a look at the hand class. We start out with a similar bracket constructor in case we need it. But this can get a bit long, hence our earlier from string method. And you can guess what's about to happen soon for hand as well. Now back to our hand. We also want string and array representations, as well as a pattern matching hook that allows array representations of our hands. Now that brings us to actually creating a hand. So back to the hand class, we have something similar to from string method here, but this one can be a bit more involved. We want to split the input string on either a comma or spaces, so we can have multiple accepted formats here, and then we want to map them all into cards. Now you might notice the underscore one here. This is called a numbered param, which is also a new Ruby 3.0 feature. This is the implied first argument. So in this case, it would be very much like saying map bracket pipe s pipe card dot from str and then passing that s into that method. Now back to our method here, we can give this a few tries. You might also notice that they're sorted, which is quite nice, also very necessary, though we'll get more into that in a moment here. This doesn't come for free, we still have to define that sort method, but we'll be getting to that soon. Now speaking of sorting, we should probably figure out how to actually sort these things as well. We'll start out with precedence, or how important each card is in relation to another card, or their rank. So back to our card class, we want to start by including comparable, which gives us an interface for sorting and comparing values. But before we do that, we want to define what each card's precedence is, so we can score each of them against each other. Some games are different in that they may use the suit as well, but this is not one of those games. Now, the interface for comparable has this lovely little rocket ship operator. It takes another instance, and we can use each card's precedence to decide which is higher, lower, or sometimes even the same. How that looks, we'll take a look in a moment here. So consider these examples, comparing these cards. If we were to look at the raw output of the rocket ship operator, that doesn't look very useful. And most of the time, people don't use it directly, and we'll get into that in a moment. So how this works is that if the left side is greater, zero for the same, and negative one for the right side being greater. So let's put this in a different format real quick. Taken another way, this means that we can have all these cards and we get sort for free from that interface, which gives us back an array that looks more like this, in which we have the rank increasing as we go along. Now onto the hand itself. Remember that sort method? Turns out there was a lot hidden in that little sort call. So if we were to take a hand, it'd sort it for us in any order that we can match against. Now pattern matching relies very heavily on order and having consistent order reduces our potential match cases substantially and allows a much clearer interface to match against. So with all that out of the way, we have cards and we have hands, but we haven't exactly gotten to scoring yet. So let's go and do just that. To start out with though, examples are always fun and useful to test against. And you can find these on the resource pages too, as I will link them in Twitter. Now, our first hand is Royal Flush, which consists of all the cards of the same suit from 10 all the way up to Ace. So taking a look at this, we can define a method on our hand to take care of exactly that. So let's add a comment for an example while we're looking at this. 
and define a predicate method or rather a boolean or truthy method to help define the idea of what exactly is a royal flush and encapsulate that. So we start out by matching against all our cards against a pattern, in this case, a one-liner. Well, I say one-liner, but as you'll see, this isn't quite true. Now, the pattern starts out with card with brackets, which for reference comes with or without that method actually being defined in a class. In fact, it's a reference for that, which is a very interesting choice. In this case, you'll notice the word suit there. Suit is what's called a captured variable, meaning whatever the suit is of that card will be fed into a variable named suit. This is going to be very important here in a moment. The other part we have is a strict value of 10 for the rank. So this is saying that we have a card inside here as the first item, which will capture the suit, and then it has to have a rank of 10. Next, we have this strange caret symbol which has the same name as that variable before. This is called a pin operator. And what it does is it makes sure any variable that is pinned matches that pattern so it doesn't assign over it. It means we can capture the suit once on that first line and in every line after that, it makes sure that that value is the same. So if it were spades, like our commented example suggests, our next card would have to be a spade, otherwise the pattern match would fail. From there on, we fill in the rest of the expected cards. And now, if we were to test that out, we find that that is indeed true. Now that brings us to our next hand, a straight flush. Now, a straight flush is both a straight, meaning all cards are one order apart, or one rank apart, and a flush, meaning all of the same suit. So going back to our hand, a straight flush might look like this. So like our previous example, we start by defining a method to check against straight flush. But unlike the other one, this might surprise you. It's actually quite boring. We just check if it happens to be a straight and it happens to be a flush. Nothing says we need any more new code than we're already going to have here in future sections and reusing other parts is perfectly fine. And we'll be getting to both of those in a moment. Now, assuming that both of these exist, we test out our example and find that that does indeed return true as well. So next up is four of a kind. So just like the name implies, that means four of the same ranked card. So going back to our hand, we might have an example of say four aces, all of different suits. And we can define our method just like before and check that our cards happen to match a pattern. Now, this one is interesting in that it has two asterisks or stars or whatever you'd like to call them on either side. This is called a find pattern, which is another experimental feature which says to find the pattern at any position inside the array. It could be at the front, it could be at the back, it could be somewhere in the middle. We don't know, but this case can handle all of those. So next we want to capture the rank. And you might notice the underscore here, which is a placeholder for any value, but we don't particularly care to save it. Next, like in previous cases, we would pin the rank to make sure the next three cards all have the same rank as the first one that we happen to capture, meaning we expect four cards of the same rank or four of a kind. Now, the pattern match is going to try and match and find this pattern anywhere inside of this collection, which means if it gets to the first rank and finds that the second rank isn't there, it's going to try again until it manages to find that or until it runs out of items. So if we're taking a look at the test for this, we would see that that does indeed work. Next, we have a full house. Now, a full house is interesting in that it has three of one rank and two of another. So going back to our hand, we can see that we have an example of three aces and two kings. So if we were to define that method, we want to start by matching against all the cards in our hand. And we have something very similar to some of the previous ones that we had in which we don't care necessarily about what suit it is. We care that we have two that happen to match one rank, and then three that happen to match the next rank. Now remember these are sorted, so we can make assumptions like this. 
But, 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 you might notice something. The astute reader might catch that I said three slash two, which yes, applies to two slash three, but that means that we have a bit of an issue. This only catches one of those cases, not both of them. So now we have a bit of an issue. If we were to take a look at this, you might notice that my code has a return true here, implying another pattern. A full house could be a three slash two or two slash three, like I was implying earlier. So we need to have two matches here to be sure. Now, there may be a way to hack this with an or conditional, but the dual capture makes that a bit of a mess. So two captures it is, which makes this a little bit easier to read and work with later. So back to the example, if we were to test it out, we'd see that our example does indeed pass. Next, we have a flush where all cards are of the same suit. So back to our hand, we start with an example. All the cards are spade, but they're not necessarily one apart in order or have any other properties to them. So we define ourselves a flush method, and then we match against all the cards inside that hand to find out if it's the same suit across all those cards, capturing the first and pinning the rest to make sure those suits are all the same. We don't necessarily care about the rank because again, a flush just checks the suit. Then we want to test against that. And if we do, we find out that our example is indeed a flush. Next, we have a straight, or all cards in order of any suit. But to start with, we're going to need to know how exactly we get the next card in the sequence because 10 to jack is not something which makes intuitive sense unless we tell Ribby how to do that. So we go back to our card and we create the idea of adding one or n to any rank. Typically, this is just one though. So the idea here is to use a ranks constant to find out what comes next in this sequence. So the next card after a king happens to be an ace. So going back to our hand, we want another example and notice the suits are very different, making this distinct from a straight flush. So let's define a method for it. And inside that, we'll match against the cards. In this case, we want to capture the first rank, but how exactly is it in pattern matching we check that that increases by one? Well, currently we do have to hack this, and this is not ideal code, and I would not suggest you do this. In fact, I would not suggest that you use pattern matching for this particular case right now. We use string interpolation as we cannot evaluate expressions in pattern matching, as you might notice if you try this experiment with certain features. But using this, we can make sure they all happen to fall into sequence. Now, again, I'm not 100% a fan of this, but I don't feel too terrible about it because there is something interesting. There is a proposal out currently for pinned expressions, which makes this code look very similar with this. So inside those parens, we capture the results of an expression. It's been approved and merged, so patches in the meantime aren't terrible, but also nothing I'd really put into production either. Remember, pattern matching will not allow expressions, hence all the syntax errors you're going to see repeatedly while trying to experiment with this. Now, this is done to try and ensure that there's a complete match, as well as making pattern matching substantially faster. If it has to run against all of these expressions, that's going to slow it down quite a bit, and that means we can't really quantify all the possible outputs as compared to static. Now, do note, as of my last reading, this wasn't deployed outside nightly, so you will have to build to get a hold of this. Anyways, back to our examples, we'll see that our hand is indeed a straight. So next we have three of a kind, which is very similar to four, except it's just three this time. So back to our hand, we want an example of say three aces and a method to go with that. So we match against the cards. We make sure that somewhere inside there, much like four of a kind, we happen to have three with the same rank, whether it be front, back, middle, or anywhere in between. So we use the find pattern again and pin the rank, otherwise to make sure three cards have at least the same rank. And because again, these cards are sorted, we can make these forms of assumptions. So if we were to test it, we'd find out that that does indeed work. So 
Two pairs, being our next, as the name suggests, are two pairs of the same ranked card. So let's go back to our hand and get an example, two aces and two kings, let's say, and define a method to match, and match against the cards in our hand. It's very similar to three and four of a kind in that we use a find pattern to allow the pairs to be anywhere in the list, and similar to full house that we have two ranks to watch, but there's an issue here. Can you spot it? Take a moment. The issue is what if we had, say, two fives, one six, and then two sevens. Well, that doesn't work then because there's something in the middle there. And this assumes that we have two and then immediately after two. So that wouldn't exactly work. So we'd have to define again, another variant of the match. So we can add a second case below, which allows it to capture a middle split just to be safe. Now, granted that there are five cards here, we could use an underscore to match for anything here, or we could use an asterisk. So going back to testing this, we find out that our example is indeed true. Bring us to our last pattern hand, a single pair. Now it's like two pairs except only one pair. So going back to our hand, we add an example of two aces. Now we define a method and we check against all of those cards and ensure that somewhere, anywhere in that pattern, there are two cards with the same rank that happen to be next to each other, our pair, that we're asking for. And again, since these are sorted, we can't do this. And if we were to test that, we'd find out that it is indeed true. Now this brings us to the fun part, scoring a game. We have most of the foundation here to do this, making the final methods tying them all together just all the more satisfying to watch them work. So let's go back to our hand and how it should know to score itself. Now remember we had those scores earlier and we can use them here. Now we use them in conjunction with all those predicate methods we have and go right down the list from most specific condition to least specific condition, allowing us to see what type of hand we have. And if nothing else matches, we go to highest card in the hand or high card as basis for score. Now, granted, this is not 100% how you might score a hand, but a particularly intrepid coder might try and implement comparable on a hand to take into account the rank as well to find out which hand wins between two of them. Now, consider that challenge. This talk is already veering a bit long, and I believe that would be a very fun exercise for some of you in the audience. Now we can run some of those examples and see if they all work. Now, remember, that we had those constants to run against. They're about to become real handy. We iterate over all of them and see whether or not they're correct. Granted, not our spec or mini test, but those don't fit quite cleanly on a slide. So here we are for a basic example. The original code has a few more rows on the final output, hence the here doc here, but condensed for the sake of presentation. We care about the hand, what its score is, whether or not it's the right score, and what type of hand it happened to be. So if we run that, we find out that we get all of the correct answers there. So congratulations, we solved a good portion of poker with pattern matching. So pattern matching is quite a fun feature. and We haven't really begun to scratch the surface of what's possible in it. This is but one of an untold amount of possibilities. Hopefully this talk inspired you to go out and try a few of your own ideas. Now, the very interesting part of this is that this is one portion of pattern matching, array-like matching, not hash-like matching, which is a much more powerful sibling in pattern matching. So even with all of this that we've explored, it's only a small portion of what constitutes pattern matching. And that in and of itself is very exciting. Now, if you want to read more of my work or examples or follow along, feel free to find me on any of the following social networks. I have posted examples up on Twitter as well as to GitHub and various other social networks. So if you do want to get a hold of those, feel free to reach out. And if you do have any questions, again, feel free to reach out. Now, pattern matching was quite an effort between a lot of folks. Sujimoto, Nobu, Zverok, and a whole lot of other Rubyists who contributed a lot of thoughts and ideas over multiple years, and they're still more pushing the boundaries of what's possible. 
I'm excited to see where we go next, but it should be noted every single time in Ruby, this is a community effort of so many people coming together to give us these beautiful new features. But that's all I have for today. It's been fun. I've enjoyed talking to you today. Have a great day. Welcome back. Hello. This was as great as I was expecting. <laughs> um, thank you so much for uh, for your talk. It was uh, an interesting deep dive into uh, pattern matching and uh, and poker. Cool, really, really great. Uh, while we wait for some questions uh, out there. Um, you were talking just now about, uh, you know, this is just one portion of the things mm -hmm. you can do about with pattern matching. Um, in which other instances do you see people being uh, making use of pattern matching more than what we currently do as a, as a community? Mm -hmm. So arrays tend to be the less powerful variant, which more people need explanation of why would you want this? What would you want to do with this in production? Poker is kind of a nice little canned example that you can show someone. But what's really interesting is when you get to hash like matches and what that allows you to do is let's say you have an HTTP response. You can match against a status code, say anything between 200 and 299 with a response body that's not empty with also these particular headers. You can do a lot of things with that because every single one of those values is paired with triple equals. You have all the expressive capabilities of a case statement baked right in there. And you're able to do some really interesting queries against that. This is also useful for things like JSON or munching data or other things like this, especially CSVs. Basically any structured data that you could think of like response, JSON, CSV, all of that, it comes in extreme handy very quickly and could be very easily used in production code. Thank you. Well, that makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, I was wondering because, you know, historically, uh, people have uh, shunned or not recommended using if statements, case statements, and uh, things like that. Where, like, why would you see pattern matching being more apt to uh, uh, to help with these instances than an if statement or or a case statement? Mm -hmm. In your I opinion, think, of yeah, of course, of course, a very fair question. A lot of what I see its benefit being is especially in a REPL whenever you're live coding or trying to go through data, especially from production, and we're working with some of the Rails people to potentially implement this on active record models as well to be able to dive through a lot of data and kind of play around with that and experiment with it on the fly. And I think that's going to be where you're going to get most extreme usage out of this very, very quickly. Past that, a lot of the usage is going to be in trying to make sure certain sets of conditions are matched. I think the full version of it with the case statement is not going to be quite as common as a one liner match, mm -hmm. which is going to be very quickly, I want this one condition to be matched. Now, if you try to put that in a single if statement, that might be very dense. You might see a bunch of and ands and a bunch of repeated conditions and otherwise. Whereas with hash condition, it's like you're querying against the object by each method in there. So that becomes very useful as well. Now, the other thing is we've only really mentioned the end version of it. There's also the right hand assignment, which a lot of people would say, why in the world would you want right hand assignment? That makes no sense. I mean, yes, fair, but right-hand assignment also comes with pattern matching, meaning you can get something very similar to JavaScript deconstruction out of this, which allows you to dig into an object and extract those values out of there. Now, of course, this is all very, very young, so we're not going to have as many examples as fully fleshed out as a case statement or an if statement, but this is more of something to get people to experiment and think about, what might I be able to do with this? As far as where it gets used in production, I think we're not fully at justification stage mm -hmm. for that, but we're at the stage of let's try it out, let's experiment, let's deploy a few of these things, see what happens. But I'd say it's ready for it. It's just more of finding the exact use cases. A lot of the problem right now is that with pattern matching, you have to implement a deconstruct method for array pattern matching and a deconstruct keys method for hash like pattern matching. Most libraries right now do not implement that. And I'd link to document in the chat over there about some of the standards and implementation of how you should consider implementing these on your own gems, your own classes. And these are some things I'm going through people with, say, 
Rails or Nokugiri or any of the HTTP libraries to try and talk to them about how might your pattern matching interface look like. And that's going to be kind of long haul is getting that last mile of actually supporting it. Nice. Thank you. Yes, I opened the tab. Uh, I'll check it later. <laughs> um, any uses uh, for production already with pattern matching in your experience? Currently, in my direct experience, I've not had a use case for that. But most of the reason being, we still have systems running 2.6 and some newer versions of 2.7. So we mm. do have to be a little bit careful with supporting syntax that might end up crashing things. There are also some JRuby applications that might not support that quite yet. I've been talking a little bit with Hedius about implementing that in JRuby and what that might look like as well and offer to help on that. So that'll eventually be coming, but it is a lot of hard work anytime you're introducing new syntax. I've tried to deal with all the edge cases, especially with something as complicated as pattern matching. Thank you. Um, I don't see any further questions in the chat. Therefore, uh, I thank you so very much for uh, your time and for joining us today. Um, I hope you will keep hanging out with us. And uh, in the meantime, have a lovely rest of the day. Have a lovely day too. Feel free to ask thank any you. questions on the side as well. Thank you. Will do. Oh.